and welcome to today's lecture on Explaining the Roman Empire. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to ask that question of why was the Roman Empire so successful for so long? What was it about it that made this thing work? So we're going to go ahead and start by setting the scene, figuring out how we got to this point in time. Then we're going to go ahead, recap our story from civil war to Roman peace. And then we're going to take a look at 10 reasons why the Roman Empire succeeded. And then we'll wrap up with some concluding thoughts. So let's go ahead and set the scene. Our story, of course, starts long before the city of Rome was ever founded, when the Italian peninsula was comprised of a diversity of tribes, the most powerful and successful of which were the Etruscans. In 753 BC, Rome was founded by Romulus, and for the next 250 years, it was ruled by a series of seven kings. And while they started out really good, they ended not so good. And that's when Lucius Junius Brutus in 509 BC started a rebellion against those kings, kicking Tarquin the Proud out of Rome and starting the Roman Republic. And the prevailing ideology of the Roman Republic is there are no kings in Rome. There is always shared power. At least two people rule at the highest position and they're voted in by the regular people. Now, it turns out that after 500 years, that doesn't work out so well because the people competing for those positions and that prestige end up using Roman armies to fight other Romans and were embroiled in a series of 100 years worth of civil war. Now, Octavian is able to come out of that victorious and eventually work out an agreement with the Roman Senate where he basically restores the public symbolically, but practically they give him sole power. And that's when we start the era known as the Roman Empire. So let's go ahead and take kind of a, a slightly more in-depth look at how we get from civil war to Roman peace. So the civil wars start with this conflict between Marius and Sulla. And Marius is the hero of the populares, the everyday people, while Sulla is the hero of the optimates, or the senatorial class. And so these guys are the first ones to take Roman armies and march on the city of Rome. All right. So when Marius gets control, Sulla takes his army and marches on the city. Marius has to get out. And then when Sulla leaves to go fight Mithridates, Marius takes his army and marches back on the city of, uh, city of Rome. And then later on, after defeating Mithridates, Sulla marches back on the city of Rome and kills like 50,000 supporters of Marius. Now, even though they kind of have these in particular battles, nobody ever really ultimately wins. And so we see the same conflict played out again decades later between Julius Caesar, the hero of the populares, and Pompey the Great, one of Rome's greatest military heroes. And he actually goes back and forth quite a bit. He starts out as kind of a pro-Sullan optimate. He eventually moves to be one of these pro-populares leaders teaming up with Caesar, but then eventually moves back towards the senatorial side of things. And they end up fighting it out at Pharsalus in 48 BC, where Caesar is able to win. But even with that victory, that doesn't settle anything in the long run. And so we see this play out again uh, a decade or so later, a little less than a decade later, between Octavian, Caesar's adopted heir, and Mark Antony, Caesar's main general. And after they team up and dispatch the senators at the Battle of Philippi in 42, they end up fighting each other at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. So, when they defeat the senators, the, tri uh, the second triumvirate breaks up the Roman world into three parts. Octavian gets the west, Antony gets the east, and Lepidus gets a little bit of North Africa. Nobody cares about Lepidus. But in this series of battles, after defeating Lepidus in 36 and Antony in 31, Octavian ends up taking sole control of the Roman world. So now he's got the west, and Octavian's got the east, and Octavian's got North Africa. He's got the entire Roman world at this point in time. Now, Octavian eventually works out that agreement with the Senate, uh, being given the title of Princeps, the first citizen, and Augustus, the revered one. And so he takes that kind of Augustus, makes it part of his name. So we'll refer to him for, uh, as Augustus from here on out. And at his death in 14, after ruling for 41 years, this is what the Roman Empire looks like. After the death of the first empire, it's just about as large as it's going to get. And we can see it 100 years later now, kind of at its peak, right? And it's more or less the same. Again, this is under Augustus. This is 100 years later. A little bit more territory, but we're really just fighting around the edges of empire. So 
Let's go ahead now and take a look at 10 reasons why the Roman Empire was successful. Why does this whole thing work? And it's an interesting question to ask because when we looked at Greece and we looked at the Athenian Empire in the 5th century BC, that only lasts for maybe 50 years. It's a relatively short period of time. Now, Greek culture lasts a lot longer than that, but their ability to kind of dominate other areas is really quite short. So Rome ends up going from 27 BC all the way for another 500 years, and you could even look kind of previously to that, uh, starting with the Punic Wars as kind of Rome's empire starting back then. So it really ends up being quite a long time. Now, the first reason that Rome kind of is so successful, right? This is probably what you were thinking of. This is an obvious one. The Roman army, right? They're really strong. They're very well organized. Uh, and this deters invasion from the outside. And it also deters rebellion from the inside. And one of the things that they do when they structure the army is when you get soldiers from particular regions, the Romans don't let those soldiers serve in their home land. Okay, so if you're a soldier from Britain and you join the Roman army, you're going to be stationed somewhere other than Britain. And what that does is it kind of prevents you from teaming up uh, with people you know in that region to foment rebellion. Now, the second reason we're going to look at are Rome's external enemies. And they turn out to be kind of fairly small in scale. Now, during the whole Pax Romana, right, during the whole Roman Empire, there's always fighting around the edge. When we say the Roman peace or the Pax Romana, it doesn't mean there's no fighting at all. It just means things internally are very peaceful. There's always still fighting around the edge, but it turns out that this doesn't matter a lot. Maybe you gain a little bit of land, maybe you lose a little bit of land, uh, but the enemies aren't strong enough to make any kind of serious impact into Roman cohesion. Now, how do you rule these areas? Well, one of the reasons Rome's successful is that it has a very light bureaucracy. And what I mean by that is they're able to govern an extremely large area of land with a very small number of kind of administrators. And so, you know, it's something like several hundred administrators to govern the entire Roman Empire. And that might sound like a lot. That's an incredibly small number of administrators to govern an area this large. You could compare this with something like Han China. So Han China is an empire around the same time as Rome, over in the east, obviously. And they have something like 50 times as many administrators as Rome does. A very different way of doing things. So if they, if they have this few administrators, right? If they have this small number of administrators, how does it actually work that they can govern such a large area? Well, that comes to the fourth reason, and that's this strategy of trickle-down assimilation. All right? So if you go all over the Roman world, these pictures are from Croatia, and you have this fine-looking professor here in front of these very Roman-looking monuments in Croatia, right? How does it get there? How do you rule places like that if you're just kind of centered on the Italian peninsula? Well, what you do is you co-opt local leaders. So here we see Vercingetorix, and he obviously didn't get co-opted, but the idea is you take other Gallic leaders and other leaders from Croatia and all these areas around the Roman Empire, and you basically incentivize them. You flip that guy at the top, and you make it really worth their while to convert other people to this kind of Roman way of living, and then you only have to reward one person. And in doing so, you don't need to set up your own people there, you can rely on this person to keep them kind of at bay, keep them Romanized, that sort of thing, without a lot of people up at the top. In addition to that, Rome is very accepting in general about kind of religious and cultural influence. So they want people to kind of be Romanized, right? They, that, that's useful for them. Uh, but at the same time, when it comes to religion and comes to kind of cultural beliefs, they're extremely open. And with religion especially, they're actually willing to bring in gods from abroad. So what we're looking at here is Mithras, all right? And he's this god from the east. Think about kind of almost the old Persian empire or something like that. And when the Roman armies go out east, they encounter kind of this god. And they're like, that guy's cool, you know? We like what he's doing, what he's bringing to the table religiously. And so they bring him back to Rome and they set up a cult for him in Rome. And Rome is basically fine with this. The more gods, the better. They have the traditional pantheon, but if you like some other god, that's just fine. And so that allows them to kind of incorporate a huge diversity of people and not upset their core beliefs 
And as long as they pay taxes, and as long as they kind of worship the, uh, the Roman emperor as well, right, then they're all good. And we remember that it's that last thing, right, that ends up getting Christians in trouble. Their kind of inability or, or unwillingness uh, to worship the emperor because they think Jesus is the, uh, the kind of only uh, person to be worshipped there. So, the sixth reason. This is very, very practical, right? Taxes in the Roman Empire were very low. Right now, think about how much you pay in taxes, right? If you know. <laughs> I always ask that question to students, and they always think, like, I don't know, the answer is 10% or something. We pay way more than that in taxes. Um, but in the ancient Roman Empire, uh, it was only about 5, 10, 5 to 10% of somebody's income that they would end up paying. And so you had to pay your taxes, but it was a fairly light burden. Today, we pay 25 or 30 or more uh, percent of our income in taxes. Now, taxation also, the argument's been that it's been good for the economy. And the reason for this is what this does is when you have to pay somebody in coin, you have to go to the market to sell your goods. So even if you're a farmer, like way out, growing your crops, right, growing grain or grapes or olive oil, right, you can't just trade that for other stuff you need. You have to go to a market, you have to sell it there so that you can get coinage, so that you can pay your taxes. And this basically brings people together in markets and facilitates a greater level of exchange. And this goes along with our seventh reason that Rome's successful, a common currency. So we saw with Augustus that one of the things he does is he links the kind of Roman mint with the provincial mint, basically making kind of an empire-wide economy. And what this does is it allows for really easy commerce across huge distances. You can go ahead and be an Egyptian dude who sails out to France, gives them a bunch of coins to buy a bunch of delicious French wine, and then sails back to Egypt. And uh, A, you've got ports in both places, and B, you can pay with your coinage, and they're going to know that it's good coinage. All right? So it lowers these transaction costs, and it facilitates large-scale, long-distance trade. Now, one of the other reasons you're able to get from Egypt all the way to France for your nice, delicious wine is the wonderful Roman infrastructure, reason number eight. So Rome is known for its roads, right? All the roads lead to Rome, and we can still see those in the archaeological record today. So this is the Via Appia running out of Rome to, Rome to Brindisium, and once you get kind of just outside the city, you can walk along this thing. It's a really cool experience to walk along a road that was built 2,000 years ago. And if you're looking closely, you can actually still see where the kind of cart marks are in the original stones, right? So where the carts would go, you get these kind of divots in the original stones. And that, along with harbors and ports and that sort of thing, helps people move themselves and goods quickly and cheaply across the empire. Now, another form of infrastructure is reason number nine, and that's the aqueducts. The only reason Rome is able to be a city of a million people is because they have clean water, all right? In the ancient world, you get these large cities and they're like hotbeds of disease, all right? The only reason that that's kind of kept at bay is because people had good, clean drinking water. And the reason they have that is because they build this enormous kind of amazing system of aqueducts leading from these kind of mountains where you get runoff, the water runoff, and then it's at something like a slope of like less than 1% over dozens of miles, right? It's just sloped that, just that much. And it ends up in Rome and everybody has access to clean water to keep them healthy and keep them hydrated. And then we turn to reason number 10, right? Perhaps the biggest reason of all, and we've mentioned this a little bit already. One of the biggest reasons that this ends up working, the empire ends up working, is because Rome stops fighting with each other, right? The Senate and the people of Rome are able to get behind a single person. And so we see that even though the Republic had some wonderful leaders, people far more intelligent than the later Julio-Claudians, right? Julius Caesar was brilliant. Caligula was crazy. And yet Caligula is ruling an empire where everything's nice and smooth and peaceful, and Julius Caesar ends up assassinated on the Ides of March. So people and the Senate's ability to get behind a single person is a huge part of what this kind of, what makes this peace last, right? The kind of general agreement not to fight with each other. So let's wrap up with a couple concluding thoughts. So we've got all these reasons, right? The Roman army, we've got weak external enemies, we've got kind of this very light bureaucracy, 
and trickle-down assimilation that helps convert people over to the Romanized way of doing things. We've got uh, a, a culture that's very accepting of other cultures, religiously and otherwise. We've got low taxes, right? Everybody loves that. A common currency which facilitates exchange. We've got excellent infrastructure. People can move all over the place in the Roman world, and they can drink clean water and stay healthy in highly urbanized cities. And then finally, right, by kind of accepting this kind of one person as ruler, they stop fighting with each other, which allows for this period of peace. And this kind of, uh, it raises a question to me, right? As I was putting this together, I was thinking, right, which is better? Is it better to have the rule of the people, where people get a vote on kind of meaningful leaders, like you have in the Republic, but have that lead to kind of chaos, right, civil war? Or is it better to have that power kind of taken away, right? People aren't meaningfully voting anymore. And yet, the world is at peace and things are going really well. So kind of, I, you know, I don't think that there's a particularly right or wrong answer to that, uh, but it's an interesting question to ask, and one that must be asked if you're trying to explain the Roman Empire. <laughs>